I could have many things to say about Brother Winfrey Claiborne and the work he's done for the Lord, but folks around here will tell you we knew him best as a preacher. Winfrey and Molly worked at the Lord's Church in Chatsworth over 15 years. He left here to head the Bible Department at Freed Harbor College. Their boys, Doran and Danny, grew up here. Doran and his son Mark are with us today. Many of the women here today grew up at the feet of Miss Molly as young girls, and many here today were married and baptized by Winford. Winford preached in this building, and as a matter of fact, the platform we're standing on is where he stood to preach. It's still under the base here. Uh, Winford educated us with the meat of the word for many years, and we really hated to see him leave. But God had other plans for him and has used his ability and the International Gospel Hour to spread God's word all over the globe. We are overjoyed to be able to have him back with us today. So much of who we are and what we know about our Lord and his word, we owe to Brother Claiborne. We thank God that he has given Winford the help to make it to this moment. And with that, I turn it over to you, Brother Claiborne. It is extremely difficult not to go back and remember and recite all the good things that happened at Chester. But that is a temptation I will have to avoid today. <laughs> but Molly and the boys and I came to Chester 52 years ago. That again is remarkable for me to remember. <laughs> I told Oren today, the very first trip we made, our son Danny was five, and he looked around, he said, it sure does look like Indian country. <laughs> <laughs> you have been so good to me all of these years. Both congregations have supported the International Gospel Hour, plus, there have been individuals who give given generously to the Gospel Hour. I'm so grateful that you still listen, and I hope you will continue to. The Lord willing, and I maintain my health until July, I will have been on the program 19 years. After I have to step down, Brother Jody Apple will be the speaker on the Gospel Hour. I left Freed Hardeman in 1993, retired, that's the third time I retired, and moved to Fayetteville. And then in February of 95, Brother Claude Gardner said, we want you on the Gospel Hour. I went home and talked to Molly about it. She was not in favor of it. I have yet to figure out why she never told me. I think she was afraid that I might be gone more than she wanted. She also knew I did not like to raise money. She said, at your age, she didn't say I was too old, she just said, at your age, you do not need that kind of pressure. But she came to understand that it was the right choice. The last few days before she died, at St. Thomas Hospital. She sat on the side of the bed and she said, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but you have to keep up your work. That's a hard assignment. But I have tried to do so. It certainly has been a challenging work. I really believe, and I think I've said this at Chatsworth before, that my work here and the work that I did in teaching in the Bible department at Freed Hardman prepared me for the International Gospel Hour. I have volumes and volumes of research that I have done not knowing, maybe the Lord knew, that I would take over the Gospel Hour. But I'm grateful that I've been able to reach so many people. And I hope in the next several months that I still am able to. I will report this on my health. About three weeks ago, 
daughter and I went to a doctor in Nashville and he said you have pancreatic cancer. The first doctor said between six months and 12 months. We thought maybe they might perform surgery, but the surgeon said no. The cancer is too pervasive. It just cannot be done. But then we had a stent installed a week ago Thursday. And he said, you should live about a year. And your life should be good. You should be able to do about what you normally do. So I'm grateful for that. In the morning, we go back to Nashville and begin chemotherapy therapy treatment. Three weeks, off a week, three weeks, and then they check to see if I'm making any improvement. I thank you for your prayers. It really has not bothered me. I asked the people at West Fayetteville, what would you think if your doctor said you have 30 days or 60 days to live? I have thought about that. I suspect you have. It has not bothered me. But I knew how much our father suffered. And I knew the pain would be great. But the guy who takes care of me, Jeremy Baker, his wife is a pharmacist. And she said, we can take care of the pain. So I guess I don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> but I'm grateful today that Doran and his son Mark are here. Mark's a, Jew, Mark's a freshman in college. Our granddaughter Hannah is a senior in college. And we're grateful for what they're doing. And I'm great, glad to see Lucian and Ellen. I have so many brothers and sisters that wherever I am, I get to see one of them. <laughs> and it's great to have Lucian and Ellen here today. Before I start our lesson today, I brought a book that I want you to have for free. It's called Books, Books, and More Books. It's an account of about 350 books on about 50 different topics. So if you're concerned about almost any moral issue, then you will find in here books that will help you. In addition, there are copies of five of my books, plus books the Gospel Hour has printed, plus books that are printed within our own brotherhood. When you have preached at a place almost 16 years, what have you not discussed? So I've had a little trouble in the last several weeks since Willard called me deciding what I ought to discuss with you. I am convinced there is no greater need in our world and among churches of Christ than the preaching of the cross. I read a great number of books on preaching. I have a large number, probably 100, 150 books on preaching. I've tried to read many of those through the years. Some of them, especially the older books, have some great material. Some of the newer ones would not make a good bonfire. <laughs> In fact, I have one book by a young man who said that we ought to keep our sermons light and informal and mixed with a lot of stories. That's not the kind of preaching Jesus did or John the Baptist or the Apostles. Nor is it the kind of preaching that will strengthen the church and challenge the world. Amen. Incidentally, I have a book entitled Preaching Christ Crucified. There is not a student of the Word who does not understand how vital, how absolutely vital the cross is to Christianity. Without a cross, there is no Christianity. The Apostle Paul talks at length about the cross especially in 1 Corinthians, but in other passages. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18, he said, For the preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. The word preaching would be better translated word. The word of the cross is to them who perish foolishness. Now dropping down to verse 21 in that same chapter, Paul said, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching 
to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them who are saved, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. I believe I understand why both Jews and Gentiles had problems with the cross. There is an Old Testament passage which says that dying on a tree is a curse. Our Lord died on a tree. The Jews could not harmonize what the Old Testament said with the crucifixion of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The Gentiles, the Greeks, had problems, probably, because a dead Savior is of no value. The truth is, a dead Savior is of no value. It is only that he was raised from the dead for our justification and to prove beyond question that he is what he claimed to be, the Son of God. Now, if you will, turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 2. And I begin reading with verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul was an educated man. We do not know how educated, but chances are he attended the great university of Tarsus, where he grew up. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of Judah's greatest rabbis. But never one time did Paul ever boast of his learning, of his knowledge. I know he was a knowledgeable man. Read Acts 17, Paul's sermon on Mars Hill in Athens, Greece. He knew the Greek philosophers. He could not have known them had he not read their works. But he never boasted about it. In fact, he said in verse 2, For I determined, literally I decided, not to know anything among you, say Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let me read that verse again. For I decided not to know anything among you, say Christ and him crucified. If he decided not to know anything except Christ and him crucified, what else could he preach? I know there are preachers that preach what they do not know. We all understand that. If you listen on Trinity Broadcasting Network or the Inspiration Channel, you understand that very plainly. You would never have accused Paul of doing that. He determined to know only Christ crucified. That's all he could preach. So whether you read his great sermons in the book of Acts or his epistles or for that matter the sermons of Peter or James or John all of them pertain to Christ and him crucified. Now I'll illustrate that in just a moment but let's look further in verse, at verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Was he afraid? What does he mean by weakness and fear and much trembling? He certainly does not mean he was afraid. I know that for a very simple reason. In Acts 20, when he addressed the elders of the church at Ephesus, he said, and now I go bound in spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city say, that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry I have received of the gospel of God. I'm not afraid. In fact, if you remember reading in Philippians 1, he said, my real desire is to depart and be with the Lord. <coughs> Oddly enough, I have an article by a Lutheran preacher who said that means Paul committed suicide. I think preachers will write anything to get attention. It does not mean that at all. It means what all of us ought to believe. Our desire is to depart and be with the Lord. If that were not true, 
your life and mine are worthless. <coughs> so I know he was not afraid. So why did he use that kind of language? Paul knew, and every preacher of the gospel ought to know, there is no greater responsibility on earth than standing before a congregation or sitting in my case and saying, I am speaking for God. If a man claims to be speaking for God, he had better be speaking for God. And the only way he can do that is to reveal, to, re to look at what God has revealed in His Word. I do not know any of God's will except this, nor does anyone else. So he was saying, I stand in fear of Almighty God and in awe of the great responsibility I have as a preacher of the gospel. And he concluded by saying, and my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul came to preach Christ crucified. I have no other choice. If I want to have God's approval, and if I should want to have the approval of good men and women, then I have to preach Christ crucified. But what does it mean? I grew up in Summer County, Tennessee, the county north of Nashville, about 40 miles. I remember hearing the older men, the congregation, the elders and others, pray for the visiting preacher and say words somewhat to this effect. We pray for our speaker today that he may hide himself, as it were, behind the cross of Christ and preach nothing except Christ and him crucified. I do not know if they fully understood that, but that's what Paul is saying. So what must I do? What, God does, what does God demand of me that I must do to preach Christ crucified? Suppose I preach on denominationalism, and I do. I have no choice about it. But is that preaching Christ crucified? With many people in the world, that's embarrassing. That's offensive. They do not want us to talk about anybody, regardless of what they teach or believe. We recently lost one of our biggest stations, WOAI in San Antonio, Texas, because we would not sign a contract that we would not talk about other religions. <coughs> we communicated with them, we talked to with them, and they said no. And we said no. We're not going to pay $500 for 30 minutes and not be able to preach what we believe. But did Paul preach against denominationalism? The church in Corinth had a most serious problem. In fact, they had many serious problems. But one of them was division. The members were saying, and this is a literal rendering of the Greek, I belong to Paul. I belong to Apollos. I belong to Cephas or Peter. And I belong to Christ. I'm tempted to ask if you can imagine such a situation. But you really do not have to imagine. All you have to do is just look around and you see that kind of attitude. In fact, the book that I am offering you free today was written because the Duluth Church of Christ in Atlanta, Duluth, Georgia, asked me to come and speak for a week on books. Every morning at uh, 10 o'clock we met and I reviewed books that I thought they ought to read. They put me in a motel right on Interstate 85. So I had to drive about two miles down into Duluth. On the way down, there were probably 15 or 20 denominational churches. You think that's what the Lord wants? And Brother Rubel Shelley says, <clears throat> denominational is not, is not wrong, but sectarianism is wrong. Denominationalism is sectarianism. There's only one kind of it. But think of brothers in Christ saying, I belong to Paul, I belong to Cephas. That's not the way they felt. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. 
Neither of us deserve credit. God deserves the credit. But Paul pled with the Corinthians. And I'm pleading with you. We must speak the same thing. Be joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. You remember what David said about unity? Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Could we reverse that and say how unpleasant and troubling it is if we're not dwelling together in unity? But is it wrong, really, simple to be divided? In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said, I could not write unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I had to treat you like babies. Why? Because you were acting like babies. All of that division that exists is the way babies act. It is carnal, sinful, to be divided. And we must work with all of our might and with all of God's help to keep the church of our Lord united. It is not united. There are people in our brotherhood who are preaching denominationalism and have become denominational. That just simply must be ended. But is that preaching Christ crucified? If it's not, Paul had no right to preach it. I have no right to preach it. Your preacher has no right to preach it. What if I preach a sermon, and I did many times at Chesapeake, on church discipline? And by the way, church discipline means more than withdrawing. The word discipline, paideia in the Greek, means the whole training of an individual. It's not just spanking or correcting a child. It's teaching, encouraging, exhorting. All of that's involved. The church disciplines its members when the preachers and the elders teach the gospel. That's a positive form of discipline. And absolutely essential. But what if I preach about withdrawing? Is that preaching Christ crucified? There was a situation at Corinth that I have never known and was not common even in ancient times. There was a brother in the church who was sleeping with his father's wife. Now not his mother. That would have been used in different language. But preaching and sleeping with his father's wife. Under the old law, that's incest. Paul said, it is commonly reported that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that a man should have his father's wife. What had the church done about it? Maybe gossip. But they've taken no step. In fact, he said, you're puffed up rather than mourning. When there is open sin in the church of our Lord, it is time for us to mourn and not to be puffed up. What did Paul recommend? He said, when you come together, in my spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver this brother to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That does not sound very loving, does it? Did you know there, did you know there are people who think you're not loving your child if you paddle him? You wouldn't, you wouldn't do that if you love the child. If the child needs it and you don't do it, you don't love him. Because he needs discipline. But, Paul said, withdraw. In fact, he gives three reasons. Number one, because the Lord says so. That's enough. In fact, he said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name means by Christ's authority. That's his arrangement. But you also do it in order to save the brother involved. You could not do an erring brother or sister a greater favor than withdrawing from them if they will not repent. It is a drastic step. I understand that. But it's a step that's absolutely essential. Let me give you one example. When I was a Harding graduate, 
We had a preacher from the city of Memphis who came and spoke to chapel at the graduate school. He talked about church discipline. He said the church here in Memphis where I preach has not been withdrawn. Not for years and years, which is typical, may I add. But he said the elders had a meeting. They drew up a list of people who were unfaithful. And they said, we're going to visit every one of them. We're going to get other members to visit all of them. And if they don't repent, we're going to withdraw them. I believe he said there were 11 people. So they started that program. Guess what happened? They gained 13 people. They didn't lose. They gained. But that's the Lord's plan. There's a third reason why Paul said you withdraw to keep the church pure. What would people of Chatsworth think if one of the elders of any congregation or preacher were involved with another woman? What would they think if you did nothing about it? I hate to tell you that it happened. And some churches do nothing about it. Paul asked this question, and it is appropriate. Do you not know that a little, little leaven leavens the whole law? Yeah, we understand that. Lucian and I grew up on a strawberry farm in Summer County. When you pick beautiful red strawberries and put them in a cup, if one of them is rotten, after a while they're all rotten. That's the principle. If you have an unfaithful member of the church and you do nothing about it, what's to keep everybody from being unfaithful and ungodly? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new love, even as Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. <clears throat> but is that preaching Christ crucified? Paul said, I determined to do nothing else. And yet here also in 2 Thessalonians 3, he demanded, not just suggested, that the church withdraw from our brothers. And by the way, the people in Thessalonica were not involved in immorality. The brothers that were subject of discipline were simply lazy. Lazy. Not working at all. That's not serious, is it? It's not in the United States, but it ought to be. You cannot preach the whole counsel of God without talking about church discipline, both the positive kind and the negative. But what if I preach against homosexuality? I'm aware that in some places I'm land in jail. A Lutheran preacher in Sweden, one of the most ungodly countries on the face of God's earth, read Romans 1. Read it. They put him in jail. A young man in Canada owned a printing company. The homosexual movement went to him and asked him if he would print some material for them, and he said no. The Canadian government fined him $4,200. But that's Canada and Sweden, not the United States. It happened in the state of Oklahoma, the deep south. And while I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, some of the young people, unless we make some radical changes, will see it happen right here in the state of Tennessee. But we shouldn't preach against homosexuality, should we? Please listen. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning with verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall inherit the king, shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous are not going to heaven. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, shall inherit the kingdom of God. They're not going to heaven. Give me no pleasure to say that. But I have no choice. The word effeminate in the Greek is malakos and means soft. In fact, the word is used of the clothing of John the Baptist. You remember when our Lord's disciples went out to find out about John, 
And they came back and Jesus said, what did you go out to hear? A reed shaken by the wind? A man dressed in soft raiment? Well, he was dressed in camel's hair and leather. Doesn't sound soft to me. But the word in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 means a man who allows himself to be used in a sexual relationship as a woman. He's the passive partner. The technical term is catamite. The second term is abusers of themselves with mankind. That's one word in Greek. And it literally means a male, male bedfellow. A man who goes to bed with another man for sexual purposes. He's the active partner. Sodomite is a technical term. Paul said they're not going to heaven. There are few preachers in the denominational world who are going to preach that. <laughs> They know they cannot survive. I preached a sermon about five or six years ago, some of you may remember it, on the simple topic male and female. I deliberately avoided using the term homosexual. I use it, but I did not. The manager or the owner of the station in Huntington, West Virginia, great station, been on it now for uh, about 19 years. But he called one of the preachers in northern West Virginia and he said, do you people sponsor the International Gospel Hour? And the preacher said, no. We contribute to it, but we don't sponsor it. And the manager said, well, a few weeks ago your preacher spoke on homosexuality. I did not. I spoke on male and female. And nobody would be offended at that, would they? And the manager said, now, we don't mind his speaking on homosexuality, but we wish it just wouldn't make us a plane. <laughs> Male and female, and you make it plain? But that's not preaching Christ crucified, is it? When you talk about fornication, by the way, fornication includes all forms of sexual immorality. It includes homosexuality, Jude 7. It includes adultery. Matthew 19. It includes premarital sex. 1 Corinthians 7. But you preach against anything the world does not approve. Then you're in trouble. And you lose station. We have not lost any station except San Antonio and the station at Noonan, Georgia. Been on that station at Noonan for a number of years. But at the time, they canceled our contract. Billy Graham was to hold a meeting, evangelistic campaign, in Nashville. And some of the churches of Christ cooperated with him. If you can believe that, I preached four sermons on that topic. I didn't mention Billy Graham. I didn't mention churches of Christ in Nashville. I just talked about the overall picture. They called and said they were canceling the program. The station's owned by the Baptist Church. So you understand why they did not necessarily approve. But is that preaching Christ crucified? I do a great amount of lecturing and writing and preaching on families. I taught marriage and family courses at Freed Hardeman 55 times. Had several thousand young people in my classes. Would it surprise you that there are preachers among us, and I'm not talking about left-leaning preachers, who think maybe we ought not to do that. We'll preach more about how to become a Christian. But the Bible strongly emphasizes family. I preached on it at Chatsworth many, many times at our radio station. In fact, one of the reasons that our elders wanted the International Gospel Hour so we could talk about families. And Paul does at length. In fact, the longest chapter on the family in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 7. I'm not going to talk about it at length because it takes too long. Although I'm tempted to do it. I don't have anything until tomorrow morning. <laughs> Let me just read a few verses to you. 1 Corinthians 7. And let me explain this before. There are members of the church who do not believe preachers ought to discuss human sexuality. Period. 
We were on a station in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. By the way, the, sta the station gave us the time. Gave us an hour every week on Thursday. And I was on for about a thousand weeks. I mean a thousand sermons. I had a letter from a member in Shreveport. And he said, I love your program. The program is a good program, but you talk about sex too much. So I keep a list. I got out my list. I copied every sermon topic that I preached in all of those years and sent them all to him. Out of a thousand sermons, probably 30 dealing with sexuality. I don't believe that's excessive. In fact, it may be too little. And when I was in one church, which I will not mention, but one chapter, I preached three sermons one Sunday morning on what I'm about to read to you. And one of the members, an older man, said, well, all Brother Claiborne ever does talk about sex. Three out of 15 years. <coughs> what does the Bible talk? How does it talk about? Let me just read a few verses. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He's saying it's good not to get married. He's not saying that the sexual relationship in marriage is not good. That's not it at all. In fact, it'd be a contradiction if he said it. Nevertheless, to avoid sexual immorality, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Now I want you to listen carefully to the next three verses. Let the husband render unto his wife, the King James says her due benevolence, but it literally means her, uh, his obligation. He has an obligation to his wife. She has an obligation to him. And they must render those obligations. That's God's plan, not mine. The wife does not have power, literally authority. The wife does not have authority over her own body. Who does? Her husband. The husband does not have authority over his own body. The wife does. Then verse 5. Defraud you not one the other. And the word defraud means to steal or to cheat or to rob. If a person withholds the sexual privilege from his partner, that's stealing. That's robbing. That's what Paul said. <coughs> you can cease the sexual relationship for a time with mutual consent. Both agree. That you may devote yourselves to fasting and prayer. And then come together again that Satan do not tempt you for your incontinency or lack of self-control. Is that preaching Christ crucified? There it is in Paul's same letter where he said, I determined not to know anything except Christ and Him crucified. Now what I'm about to read to you, all people, I hope, will agree that this is preaching Christ crucified. In 1 Corinthians 15, that great chapter on the resurrection, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach, that you receive, wherein you stand, if you keep in memory that which I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I spoke unto you first of all, that which also I received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried. And he arose the third day according to the scriptures. Unfortunately, sometimes we preachers stop there. And we talk about the three facts of the gospel. That's cutting short what the apostle said. After talking about the death, burial, resurrection, he said, and he was seen. People saw him. He did not need to establish the death of Christ or the burial. When people die, you bury them. He didn't need to establish that. These are well-known facts. But who has ever seen a person after he was raised from the dead? So Paul said he was seen. First of, of the apostles, he was seen of Paul. He said in one, born out of you see it. He was seen of 500 brethren in Galilee at one time. Could not have been a delusion. He was seen of brethren 500 times. In fact, Paul said, in effect, if you don't believe that, you just make a trip over to Galilee because more than half of those people are still alive. And they can tell you 
that they saw Jesus. They were witnesses. And the New Testament strongly emphasizes witnesses, both on the day of Pentecost on Solomon's porch and also at the house of Cornelius. The witnesses to our Lord's resurrection. Now you know that's preaching Christ crucified. But so is the rest of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians. And so are 1 and 2 Peter and 1 and 2 and 3 John. What about the Old Testament? That's not preaching Christ crucified, is it? Read the preaching of Jesus and of the apostles and see how often they refer to Old Testament examples. For example, Hebrews 11, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. Old Testament characters. Now we do not follow the precepts of the Old Testament. They've been nailed to the cross. Colossians 2. In fact, the author of Hebrews said, concerning Jesus himself, these were the words of the Lord. I come in the volume of the book, it is written to me, to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. He takes away the old covenant, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are justified. We use the Old Testament as examples of faith and faithfulness and encouragement. Who was more courageous than Elijah? Who was more disastrous as a king than Ahab or Manasseh or Jeroboam the first or Jeroboam the second? You remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians? These things were written for our admonition. Why are they recorded? For our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world have come. They are included not to fill up space, but to give us wonderful examples. Let me close today by reference to the great book of Galatians. Galatians, as you know, was written to show that we're not under the old covenant, the law of Moses, but under the new covenant. And he said, you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When we know the gospel of our Lord, which we learn through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how do we translate that into action? The book of Acts tells us. You may remember a few weeks ago that I spoke on the gospel hour. What if we did not have the book of Acts? And for many denominational groups, they'd be just as well off because many of them almost never preach about it. But how do you learn how to be converted? They have Pentecost, Samaritans, Ephesians, Corinthians. So today, if you're not a member of the body of Christ, you know what God wants you to do. You don't have to guess about it. You know what it means to believe Christ crucified and to preach it. You know that. So will you confess your faith before this good audience and before our Father in heaven? And if on that confession and turning away from sin, you're baptized today to become a member of the body of Christ and to be on your way to heaven. If you're unfaithful, come back right now as we stand and sing together. <laughs>